Welcome. It's the AEMT lecture series. We're back. We got a new look, a better sound, I hope. And um, so uh, our lectures hopefully will be better now. So I'm excited about that. And so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to put chapter 27, I'm going to do a lecture on that, even though you guys had it uh, for the uh, last week in class, uh, since we're having such issues with the computer. But I wanted you guys to have access to it for studying purposes and things like that. Give me just a second to get this set up. Okay, so chapter 27, again, um, what I want to do is start off with a video. Let me set the video up real quick. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we just saw the video of a person who has a gunshot wound. Stand by one. Let me get everything back up here. All right, here we go. Yeah, somebody who's bleeding says a very. There we go. All right, so um, gunshot wound to the abdomen. Um, and that kind of goes with what we're going to talk about today is bleeding. So what, let's talk about it for a second. So we had a gunshot wound. It appeared to be right quadrant, um, superior to the umbilicus, right? And lateral to the umbilicus. And so if uh, it was like right in the line there, uh, we're going to call it right, let's call it right upper quadrant. And so first thing we think about is, what organs do we have there? What what are we what are we looking at as far as damage? And so we know that in that right upper quadrant we've got the liver, and it's a it could be a um, major factor for um, hypovolemic shock, right? And so what are some of the th other things we think about? Well, the patient had an entrance wound. But the patient also had an exit wound uh, that that was discovered. And so let's talk about the physiology first uh, behind bleeding. Because if you don't understand the physiology behind bleeding, um, you're you're not gonna make it through AEMT school. It's just it's it's just that simple. You have to understand what is the body, how is the body reacting to this? And uh, so we see this guy and we approach him and he's, and we, we run this call quite often and we have a person who's been shot and we approach the patient. He's talking so we can, we feel pretty good that his airway is open and he's maintaining his airway. He's conscious. Okay. When we assess his breathing, he appears to be breathing. Uh, he's breathing. It appears to be somewhat normal breathing. Uh, then we would check his circulation. We would check for radio pulse, skin temp, color, right? 
And all these factor in. And so if we discover signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock, we're going to go ahead and put that patient on a non-rebreather, 15 liters per minute. Uh, patient's in shock uh, if he's you know showing signs and symptoms of that. So we've covered the basics, or, or basically the primary survey. So let's talk about... Now, how is the body going to respond to this? And <clears throat> by understanding how the body responds to this, we can know how to treat it. Okay, so in class, when I was giving this lecture, I was asking those questions to get in responses. And basically, folks were telling me, yeah, well, you know, he's going to have vasoconstriction. He's going to start shunning blood up to the core. His heart rate would be elevated. Um, basically, all of physiology was defined by the class. And then they saw the definition. They saw preload and they saw afterload on this slide. And they lost their mind. And they shouldn't. We shouldn't lose our mind because you know these definitions. At least the class knew these definitions. You guys knew these definitions. Um, but when you saw the word for it, you kind of freaked out. That's okay. And so we have preload and afterload. And so what I, I used a couple examples. And so we used a fire for instance and I said that you roll up on a working structure fire working house fire uh, you pull an inch or three quarter line you go to the front door um, the hose lines charged and you open the knob and nothing comes out and so you immediately get on the radio and you're like, you know, tailboard one to drive to driver. You know, I need some water on the blue line. I need some water on the, on the blue line. Okay. And so the body's kind of doing the same thing here. It knows that it's losing blood and it knows it needs it. It's got to preserve what it can and it's got to use the remaining blood efficiently right so what's happening is go back to that guy let's let's don't lose the image of what he looked like okay so the body's going to respond by vasoconstriction all right those vessels are going to vasoconstrict and it's going to bring blood blood up to the core of the body it's going to try to, during vasoconstriction, it's going to try to get as much blood as it can coming back to the right side of this heart. Okay. It's going to come into the right atrium, right? It's going to go to the tricuspid valve, into that right ventricle, right? Through the pulmonic valve, out through the pulmonary arteries, coming back over here to the left atrium, all right, through the bicuspid valve down to the left ventricle. And so what is going to happen here with this left ventricle? All right, and so this left ventricle receiving that blood now, what it wants to do is enlarge this, this left ventricle as much as it can. Okay, it wants to bring the ventricle out as much as it can in order to slingshot blood up the aorta, around that aortic curve, and back down to feed the cells. Okay, so that's what it wants to do. That is the goal here, is to, to be able to circulate the remaining blood that we have all right, circulate it quicker 
and more efficiently. Well, that's preload. Okay. That is what that's what we're looking to do. And so that's what's happening here to this guy lay, laying in the roadway. He is his body's in attempting to increase preload in order to use the blood more efficiently. And so what about afterload? Okay. So what is going on in afterload? Well, in afterload, basically what we're seeing is that vasoconstriction that's happening. We're seeing that those vessels are becoming smaller in diameter in order to be able to constrict and send that blood up. And so we've got preload and afterload that's been activated. Okay. So these are big, big definitions. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm showing my pen on the wrong screen. Still got to get through the growing pains of a new system, but thank you, Chief Roberts, and thank you, command staff here at DeKalb County Fire Rescue for doing, for giving me the tools, because this is great. But anyway, it's back to the lecture here. All right, so preload and afterload again. And yeah, they're, they're, they're words, and we have to understand what's going on. So how can we apply it? How can we see it? I'm telling you it's happening to this guy who's out there in that roadway, but how can we see it? All right. And so I just mentioned preload here and I, and I drew out this, you know, this illustration of the left ventricle. And so when we look at blood pressure, when we look at blood pressure, when we look at systolic blood pressure, that's a direct representation of what is going on with the left ventricle okay if the left ventricle is performing well then you're going to have a normal blood pressure right around 120 we'll use the uh the common 120 over 80 okay uh, but if the left ventricle is not performing well right for whatever reason if that left ventricle is not performing well then systolic is going to come down. Okay, systolic will come down. In this case, right, if the left ventricle is performing higher than normal, then we're going to see a systolic blood pressure go higher. Okay. So the body, again, attempting to increase preload. All right, so we might see initially an increase in systolic pressure. But we know the problem with this. The problem with this is that we're losing blood. And so while we're losing blood, it's going to be really hard for preload to continue. All right? It's going to be hard for it to maintain preload. But you'll see preload in systolic blood pressure. What about afterload? Where can we see the representation of a vessel diameter? All right, and we're going to see that in the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, and so we will see the diastolic blood pressure if afterload has been activated. I'm going to do it on this side because this afterload is, well, preload's coming in on that right side of the heart. That's where you're really seeing uh, preload start to get to the left ventricle. So after load, you're going to see a direct representation in the diastolic blood pressure, and you'll see an increase because the pressure, uh, I'm sorry, because diastolic blood pressure is a direct representation of vessel size. Okay, vessel size. <clears throat> so is that diameter of that vessel becomes smaller. It's increasing the pressure, okay? And you're gonna see that in your diastolic blood pressure. So, if, let's just say we have a blood pressure of 134 over 94. Well, 
one blood pressure is not going to tell me a whole lot. Okay. That first blood pressure, when that ambulance gets there and they get that patient on the stretcher and they move into the ambulance and we throw that blood pressure cuff on and we hit that NIPP, NIBP start on the live pack 11 or 15, I'm sorry. We hit that blood pressure button and it gives us this first blood pressure. So we're going to, this patient's critical. So we're going to take a second blood pressure in five minutes. And what if we seen something like this? What if we seen 126 over 108? I'm not going to do the math on it, but I could tell that the systolic is dropping and the diastolic is rising up. So that's telling me something. That's telling me that preload might be, it might be failing. All right. Uh, the body's attempting to uh, survival mode here to maintain that homeostasis. Okay. It's, it might be failing a little bit. And so then we have afterload who's trying to compensate for that as well and it's really it's just it's clenching down it is just clenching those those vessels is making them as small as they can get okay so this is the physiology behind bleeding and you have to get this if you don't get this you need to get with me you call me so that we can work this out if you could understand physiology, it makes everything else go a lot better. Okay, so after the vascular resistance, what I was just talking about. Okay. Preload's going to increase that pressure. Afterload has to pump against it. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about blood pressure. Okay. Let's talk about the cardiac cycle. So blood pressure is going to equal your cardiac output. Okay. Cardiac output. And we're going to multiply that by peripheral vascular resistance. Okay. Or heart rate. That's how we're going to come up. That's how we come up with a blood pressure. All right, so what is cardiac output? Well, definitions again, right? But cardiac output is the amount of blood that's pumped through the entire circulatory system in one minute. Okay? So the amount of blood that goes through the entire circulatory system in one minute. Now, stroke volume, milliliters per beat. So what is blood pressure dependent on? So blood pressure is dependent upon the amount of blood that we have to send through the whole uh, circulatory system. So it's dependent upon the amount of blood and it's dependent upon the heart rate. So we're losing out on the amount of blood that we have because we're bleeding out. And so the heart rate, the heart rate's going to go up. Heart rate's going to go up to maintain blood pressure. All right, so the heart rate's going to have to go up in order to send what red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets we have to oxygenate those cells. So if I'm losing those, then the ones I have are going to get what? They're going to get double duty or triple duty. They've got to get through that system quicker. And the heart knows that. <clears throat> the brain knows that. Right? So, speaking of which, the brain knows this. So, what does the brain do? What, what hormones can it release to help? So, it's going to release. What's going to cause vasoconstriction? Well, epi and norepi will. Okay? So, that's what causes the vasoconstriction, and it also helps the heart to contract stronger and faster. Okay, so that's where that come that part of it comes in. Now, the side effect of epi and norepi. 
Okay, because it has a side effect. And the side effect is something that's, you know, we can see. Right? We can see. And so it activates the sweat glands. A lot of times you'll have a cardiac patient who is blood pressure is really low. They're complaining of chest pain and they're sweating like they ran a marathon. Right? That sweating is coming from the epi and norepi being released. Okay? The blood pressure is low. Body knows it. Releases the epi and norepi. And that's where you get the blood pressure. I'm sorry. That's where you get the sweating from. The patient didn't like just run a marathon. Right? All right. So cardiac output where blood pressure is dependent upon blood volume and it's dependent upon the heart rate. If the heart rate's too fast, that's not going to help things. Gets too fast, the, the, the ventricles can't fill. If it gets too slow, then we can't get enough blood out, right? So there, there could be problems there. So those are the things, again, those are physiology. You have to understand it because that's what's going on with that guy out there, that guy we just saw who's laid in the street with a bullet hole. The energy that went through his body, the cavitation, caused an injury pathway, right? We have an exit wound. Exit wound is going to be larger usually than the entrance wound. And a lot of times, bleeding more severely from the exit wound. You saw the firefighter paramedic there. He put that trauma dressing on the patient's back and had the patient kind of roll over to hold that in place to stop bleeding. The bleeding wasn't severe, but it was. A, but it doesn't matter that it wasn't severe. It's still bleeding. And we need to try to stop that. And don't forget, when we're losing blood, we're losing hemoglobin. That carries oxygen in that red blood cell. Don't forget it. Do not forget it. All right. Here we have just like a conversion. So here we have a pint of blood, and we have two cups. Two cups equals one pint. But it helps you to kind of put it together. So the typical adult loses more than approximately two pints of one liter of blood. Okay. Um, that's a substantial blood loss. Okay. And we should see... If you have two cups of blood loss, we're going to see that in vital signs. For what vital signs? So we already talked about it, but let's, let's just make sure everybody's clear. We're going to have an increased heart rate. What about respiratory rate? Do you think the respiratory rate is going to go down or go higher? So let's go back to chapters 7 and 8. All right, anatomy and physiology. And let's talk about it. So if... if I'm not able to oxygenate cells. And remember, cells make tissues, and tissues make organs, and organs make organ systems. So if I'm not able to oxygenate cells, I can't get oxygen in there. Glucose is there waiting on oxygen. It doesn't arrive. Pyruvic acid is going to turn to what? Lactic acid. And that lactic acid is going to eventually make that patient acidotic and eventually kill the cell. How do we get rid of acid? Right? We're going to increase our respiratory rate. So our, so our trauma patient here should be tachycardic and the respiratory rate is going to be high. Okay? Maybe, maybe greater than 24 but we should expect a faster respiratory rate. And don't forget kids, that because this is an adult representation, kids are going to have less blood volume, so all they, you know, they can lose less blood and react very greatly to that. And the same for their, uh, same for their plasma when they are vomiting, diarrhea they're going to respond much quicker to a very little bit of vomiting than an adult will. 
And so hemorrhagic shock, let's talk about it. So inadequate tissue perfusion, that's what it is. That's shock. So we should consider bleeding to be serious with a significant mechanism of injury. Would you agree that a bullet to the right upper quadrant with an exit wound out the back is a significant mechanism of injury? I would too. We need to look for the other signs. Poor general appearance. The patient could be pale, cool, diaphoretic. All are signs of hypoperfusion. As soon as you find those signs, you need to treat that patient for hypoperfusion. We'll talk about treatment in a second. All right, hem uh, hemostasis. So well, I'm going to come back to that slide because I want to talk about this first right here. So the lethal triad. <clears throat> what kills trauma patients all right, and bleeding? So the lack to be able for the blood to clot. All right. So when we talk about blood clotting, <clears throat> I noticed that the video, and I'm not armchair quarterbacking. I'm not. Uh, the the medic seemed pretty knowledgeable. But the first thing that they did was after the you know trauma dressing was applied, I saw both you know firefighters fixing to start IVs, and that's the appropriate treatment per se is to start an IV for fluid replacement. But that bag of sodium chloride, normal saline, will it replace red blood cells? It will not. Okay. It will not. As a matter of fact, too much of that sodium chloride is going to... Oh, let me get my pointer here. Too much of that normal saline is going to affect how the body coagulates blood clotting. If you give too much saline to this patient, then they're not going to, it's going to be worse for them. The other thing that kills um, trauma patients, hypothermia. So I'm going to be quite honest. They would have done that patient better by throwing a blanket on him as opposed to throwing two tourniquets on and, uh, you know, getting those IVs. Hypothermia. And so think about uh, the function of blood. Besides the delivery of, of oxygen and other minerals, what's the other function of blood? It's to regulate temperature. Okay, so it regulates temperature. We're losing blood, so therefore the temperature is going to suffer, and we're going to get hypothermic. Now let's go ahead and add some cold normal saline or sodium chloride to this picture. So again, are we really helping the patient? Uh, now I'm not saying don't because that's the, right now is the appropriate treatment, but I'm what I'm saying is is that benefits, risk and benefits. And I'm telling you, the patient would have benefited more from just a, something you learned as a basic EMT is to treat the patient for shock. Let's cover them up. Let's cover them up. So we have hypothermia to deal with. The body's ability to, to clot and the other thing that kills trauma patients is acidosis, okay? And that is coming from blood loss, okay? And so active bleeding, we have to stop because the more bleeding, the less red blood cells to deliver oxygen to the cell. And back to the IV thing, <clears throat> uh, paramedics, firefighter paramedics, we all tend to have that type A personality. And once we go to start that IV, if we miss, what do you think happens? 
right afterwards. Yep. We're going to try that stick again with a stretcher there with the patient ready to go because in our head, it's only going to take 15 more seconds. This patient has great veins, but realistically, it's about a minute, two minutes. All right. So all that stuff you need to think about in your head and you can't think about it in your head if you don't understand you know, pathophysiology. Here we have a splint. And so the air splint. I just wanted to remind you that not, uh, the, not only uh, a splint stabilizing a fracture is, yeah, is the function of a splint, but the other function is to prevent blood vessels from being like, uh, you know, cut by, by sharp bone ends, but also um, it can go a long ways to help control bleeding. But it's not our first thing, right? We don't, we have uncontrolled bleed. We don't say, okay, go ahead, apply a splint. We don't. First thing we do is direct pressure. Very first thing. If direct pressure doesn't work, the next thing we do is apply a tourniquet. And so I want to show another video about tourniquets, but it also goes a long ways to talk about bleeding and things like that. So hang on one second and let me load the video. If you can only do one thing for the casualty, stop him from bleeding to death. Early control of severe hemorrhage is critical. Injury to a major vessel can quickly lead to shock and death. Only life-threatening bleeding warrants intervention during care under fire. Life-threatening bleeding can be identified by several characteristics. There is pulsatile or steady bleeding from the wound. Blood is pooling on the ground. The overlying clothes are soaked with blood. Bandages or makeshift bandages used to cover the wound are ineffective and steadily becoming soaked with blood. There is a traumatic amputation of an arm or leg. There was prior bleeding and the patient is now in shock, unconscious, confused, or pale. How long does it take to bleed to death from a complete femoral artery and vein disruption? Casualties with such an injury can bleed to death in as little as three minutes. This is a femoral artery bleeding. It does not take long to die from this. All personnel should have a COTC recommended tourniquet readily available and be trained in its use. Casualties should be able to easily and quickly reach their own tourniquets. Do not bury your tourniquet at the bottom of your pack. Where a tourniquet can be applied, it is the first choice of control of life-threatening hemorrhage in care under fire. Forget about direct pressure, pressure dressings, and anything else. If you have severe extremity bleeding in the care under fire phase, go directly to a tourniquet. The medic in this unit was killed in the battle in which this soldier was wounded. Others in the unit attempted to control the bleeding from this soldier's wound just below his left knee. The improvised tourniquets were ineffective and the soldier bled to death. Don't let this happen to your buddies. Apply a tourniquet without delay if indicated. The casualty and the medic are in grave danger when a tourniquet is being applied. The risk of further injury versus that of bleeding to death must be made by the person rendering care. Apply the tourniquet without removing the uniform. Make sure it is clearly proximal to the bleeding site. If you are uncertain about exactly where the major bleeding site is, such as in night operations or multiple wounds, apply the tourniquet high and tight, as proximal as possible on the arm or leg. Tighten the tourniquet until bleeding is controlled. If the first tourniquet fails to control the bleeding, apply a second tourniquet just above the first. Don't put a tourniquet directly over the knee or elbow. Don't put a tourniquet directly over a holster or a cargo pocket that contains bulky items. Unscrupulous manufacturers make and sell knockoffs that look very much like kotsi approved limb tourniquets. They have poor quality and numerous failures have been reported. There are many common mistakes made by first responders applying tourniquets. Not using one when you should or waiting too long to put it on. Not pulling all the slack out before tightening. Using a tourniquet for minimal bleeding. 
putting it on too proximally if the bleeding site is clearly visible, not taking it off when indicated during tactical field care, taking it off when the casualty is in shock or has only a short transport time to the hospital, not making it tight enough. The tourniquet should both stop the bleeding and eliminate the distal pulse, not using a second tourniquet if needed, periodically loosening the tourniquet to allow blood flow to the injured extremity. These lessons learned have been written in blood. Only use a tourniquet for severe bleeding. These wounds do not need a tourniquet. Neither wound is life-threatening. Bleeding is minimal. A tourniquet should not be used on these two wounds or other wounds like them where the bleeding is not severe. It is expected that tourniquet application will cause some pain, but it will also save your casualty's life. Tourniquets hurt when applied effectively. It does not necessarily indicate a mistake in application. It does not mean you should take it off. Manage pain per TC3 guidelines. After any tourniquet application, monitor the casualty closely to ensure that the tourniquet remains tight and that bleeding remains controlled. Reassess, reassess, reassess. Okay, so I think it was a good video. A couple of things I want to point out. <clears throat> One, um, you know, they tell the soldiers, you know, to keep their tourniquet, you know, available. And we should do the same. Um, the tourniquet can't be at the bottom of the jump bag. You have to be able to, to locate your tourniquet immediately because it's you don't need to be fumbling around looking for where your tourniquet is. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I liked about the video, it talked about uncontrolled bleeding. You know, you have a pulsating bleed. You have a um, the clothes are saturated with blood or the bandage that you're using is direct pressure is saturated with blood. So all of those, you know, are extremely important to remember. All right. And then the treatment. So we talked about it already, kind of. All right. So, you know, pulse oxes don't mean anything if you have signs of hypoperfusion. Go ahead and treat your patient with oxygen, high flow, Don rebreather. We want to establish an IV at the appropriate time and place. Okay, so wherever do, we never delay transport for an IV of uh, sodium chloride or lactated ringers, and then we're administering enough fluid to return a radial pulse. That's what we're looking for. We don't want to give too much fluid because we're going to, you know, if we give too much fluid, the body loses its process to, to clot. Okay. Also in this chapter, you know, uh, I think it talks about, um, well, anyway, we already covered the tourniquet thing, you know, when we put it on. So direct pressure doesn't work. We go to a tourniquet, right? And it's our second step. And we, you know, put it on, you know, proximal but higher than the wound. And we don't put it over joints or anything like that. All right. So this is going to conclude the video for Chapter 27, I believe. And we'll have some more videos out shortly. See you next time.